wow, what a stimulating morning. Uh, this, is, uh, this has been very interesting. I have, don't pretend to have followed all of, the, all of the neurophysiology, but it's been very interesting to uh, see the different perspectives. I hope that all of you have had a chance to totally memorize <laughs> David's slides. They were rather heavy on text and also on facts, and those are both hard things to to process, but uh, it's it's good to uh, it's good to hear these different perspectives. I'm going to uh, totally dodge this question about the endogenous possible endogenous functions of DMT. Certainly, we know when we take DMT and ex from exogenous sources, plants or fungi, it has profound effects and possibly evolutionary and cognitive effects, and that's what I'm going to talk about. And you can relax, my slides are mostly graphic, uh, very little text, and some will say very few facts. So <laughs> this will be easy for us, right? Uh, you've all heard me say this. I rap about this constantly. All plants are chemists. And they're chemists because of their mastery of photosynthesis, this ability to take energy from the sun through their light harvesting pigments and uh, uh, combine that with carbon dioxide and water as reactants and develop complex uh, organic chemistry. And uh, because they have this ability, they're even better chemists maybe even than Dave Nichols, although I wouldn't want him to put them up against him directly, but, <laughs> <laughs> but plants can, can do all this uh, using these reactants and they create a great many uh, compounds which are found almost universally in life. These are the, the blue boxes and you can think of these as very universally distributed, the molecules of life, essentially essential for life. But also, out of because of their ability to make compounds and, and have their not limited really because they have all the energy they need to drive chemical reactions, so they make a whole variety of secondary compounds uh, as well. And these have, they're not universally distributed, they're found in specific families or specific genera. And it used to be thought that they were just kind of physiological noise, you know, kind of like DMT in the brain, no real function. But now we understand that all these secondary compounds have a great deal, uh, a great deal of importance in mediating the relationships between plants and uh, other organisms in, in their environment. Oh, I should also mention about uh, photosynthesis a couple of important things because it's relevant to what we're going to be talking about in a minute. Byproduct of photosynthesis, conveniently for us, is oxygen. And the other important function of photosynthesis in the biosphere is carbon dioxide is one of the reactants to photosynthesis. So plants and other photosynthetic organisms, including bacteria, you know, uh, uh, cyanobacteria and other microorganisms that photosynthesize, are one of the big factor, if not the main factor, that is maintaining carbon dioxide balance in the atmosphere because these things sequester carbon dioxide into organic compounds, into biological matrices. So that's kind of important, especially the oxygen part as well, and the carbon dioxide part because the balance of these two gases in the environment is critical to the sustainability of, of life on Earth. Well, what do plants do with all these <coughs> secondary compounds? What they do with them is they use, they substitute biosynthesis for behavior. They're great chemists, but they're not so good at running away from danger. So essentially, they use these, these uh, secondary molecules as messenger molecules to send, to interact with uh, other organisms in their environment, like other plants, fungi, and microorganisms with which they home form uh, symbioses in, in, the, in the soil, insects, which are important, of course, in the pollination of plants. That's all mediated through uh, plant-insect uh, chemical uh, relationships, symbioses, if you will, herbivores, which are simply things that like to nibble on plants, 
and humans. All of this is mediated through plant uh, secondary chemistry. And there are various functions uh, that these secondary compounds have. One of the simplest and sort of least interesting in some ways is defense. Some of these things are simply toxins and they send a message to uh, or other organisms, stay away from me. I'm a bad guy and uh, you don't want to eat me because you will regret it. But more often uh, it sends a, a, a lot of these functions are semiotic. They send signals and more often and more interestingly the signal is about symbiosis. Not necessarily stay away but come closer. Let's do interesting things together that might mutually benefit us. And of course that's instantiated mainly as, I mean, insect-plant interactions uh, are the, one of the main examples of that. But humans too participate in this symbiotic relationship. Every plant that we select out of the uh, environment and uh, domesticate is the term, uh, cultivate, we protect it from the vicissitudes of evolution we, sub we subject it to our own vicissitudes in terms of our official selection, but we usually do that because it produces a chemical of interest or a group of chemicals. That might be a medicine, that might be something like DMT, it might be a nutrient, it might be a fragrance, a color, whatever. We value plants basically because plants have great chemistry and, and we have uh, adopted that and use it uh, for our, uh, our own purposes. So we form these symbioses with plants, as does almost everything, um, almost everything in the, in the ecosystem. Um, and uh, and that's, that's a good thing. So the Gaia hypothesis is another area of controversy here. Uh, the Gaia hypothesis is uh, Gaia uh, hypothesis is simply the idea that the Earth is alive in a certain sense. The Earth is our mother, and uh, this notion is found in the most ancient traditions of uh, the Greek idea of Gaia, but in many other uh, uh, traditions. And, and without bringing science in it so much, a moment's reflection: uh, this is obviously true, Gaia is the cradle of life uh, and it's the cradle of all species. It nurtures and keeps alive all living things on the planet, including uh, her most problematic species, uh, the human race. And the science behind this uh, originated with James Lovelock's idea of Gaia. He was a uh, geophysicist and uh, he, a uh, geophysicist, geochemist, and he wrote a book in 1979 called Gaia, A New Look, Life on Earth. And he argues that the biosphere, the entire community of life on Earth, actively modulates the global ecosystem and keeps planetary conditions within the relatively narrow limits that are optimum or at least tolerable for life. So in other words, in, on the geochemical level, on the global level, the levels of carbon dioxide the salinity of the oceans, the levels of oxygen and so on, are a reflection of biological activity. They would look very different if there were no life on Earth. And uh, he articulates the major parts of this biospheric geophysiology that he hypothesized and consists of the atmosphere, the geosphere, the hydrosphere, the biosphere, which importantly should include a subset of that, I think, the phytosphere, as important to mention. And just as the functions of the body work together through complex homeostatic feedback loops, these biosphere level systems are similarly regulated. And the living part of the system actively intervenes to keep critical parameters within limits that life can tolerate. And it's managed to do this for, oh, 4.5, 4 billion years or so. Life appeared first about four, maybe a little earlier than that. And it's maintained conditions amenable to life ever since. So important parameters, the temperature, salinity, and the pH of the oceans. Composition of the atmosphere, as we mentioned, and surface temperature. And it's worth mentioning, without 
going into it too much, but we're busily sort of uh, undermining some of these homeostatic mechanisms. So Earth is essentially a superorganism. Superorganism is a collection of organisms that act as a single organism. So uh, it, it's like the cells of a body, but it's all the same genetics. Many examples exist of superorganisms. Anthills, uh, termite colonies, and beehives are superorganisms. Uh, naked mole rats and <laughs> coral reefs are superorganisms. And guess what? So are humans. Humans have a great deal of the biomass, and humans is made up of not humans, if you've all heard of the biome, and actually the biomes in humans vary depending on where they occur, but up to 30 to 40 percent of uh, our cellular, uh, of, of biomass in an average human is not our genes, our cells, it's, uh, it's the biomes that live inside of us. And, uh, with which we symbiose. So symbiosis and homeostasis, all of these superorganisms function due to these important processes. Symbiosis is the close association of two or more organisms, usually to uh, mutual benefit, two or more different kinds of species. Homeostasis is simply the state of being in balance, a tendency to maintain constant internal conditions despite large changes in the external environment. All of this is maintained by feedback, information that informs a system about the internal state and external conditions and responds to that. Feedback, obviously, is essential for maintaining homeostasis. So on a local level, a small level, plant secondary compounds can be thought of as the neurotransmitters of the Gaia mind. They are the chemicals that tie all these homeostatic mechanisms and feedback mechanisms together through chemistry, through secondary products. This is the language of plants. Chemistry is the language of plants. And they engage in complex signal transduction conversations. You can think of them with everything in the biosphere. And in this way, they regulate interactions with every ecosystem, every organism and every ecosystem of every size from local ecosystems such as shown here, the size of a background backyard garden to the planet size ecosystem that we call the biosphere or sometimes Gaia. And they do this, these processes through signal transduction and biosemiotics. They're basically just big words for for, di for these different processes. Homeostasis at the organismic level and the biospheric level is maintained through these feedback loops. Signal transduction is the process that mediates that. When it happens at the organismic level, it's called signal transduction. At the ecosystem level, it's called biosemiotics. I don't know why they're different, but both of these, an important commonality is that these processes involve transmission of information mediated by chemical messengers. That's what these secondary products are, i.e., for example, neurotransmitters. So about, a hun about one eighth of the human genome is dedicated to signal transducing molecules. And signal transduction mo occurs when an extracellular molecule binds to a receptor on the surface of a cell or inside the cell or an enzyme or some molecular target and triggers a biochemical chain of events known usually as a signaling cascade. And so the choreography, uh, organisms are uh, highly, uh, we think of them as object, but actually they're processes. And signal transduction is like the director of the show. It coordinates biological processes in space and time. This is just, I'm not gonna go into this obviously, uh, but just shows the signal transduction processes going on in a single mammalian cell. So then we get to the brain, right? And the brain is a complex biochemical machine that is specialized for signal transduction via neurotransmission. All of its critical functions, including our experience of conscious awareness, are mediated by this neuronal communications network. And neurotransmitters, as you know, are small molecules that mediate the crosstalk between the neurons. 
And here's just a schematic model of a neuron, and usually the uh, neurotransmitters are released from the presynaptic membrane, cross this gap, and bind to one or more receptors on the receiving membrane, the postsynaptic membrane, and from that, things happen or don't happen sometimes because some of these things are antagonists. But usually there's a, a, an activation of some further intracellular uh, signal, tra uh, signal transduction process. And most psychoactive drugs function by affecting these processes. The synthesis or the storage, the release, the degradation, or the reuptake of neurotransmitters, or by mimicking or blocking the effects of neurotransmitters in, in uh, synaptic receptors, like a lot of our favorite psychedelics, like DMT, for example. So we're biochemical engines we're made of drugs. This is the thing. Get over it. We are made of drugs. I'm sorry to tell the <coughs> Partnership for Drug-Free America, but that's the fact of it. We're biochemical engines that run on drugs, hormones, enzymes, neurotransmitters, uh, and so on. Those are drugs. Brain neurotransmitters and plant messenger molecules evolved from the same evolutionary precursors, and they probably served similar functions. These messenger molecules were internalized for signaling functions before they had act before they had ecosystem-wide effects. So it's not surprising that plants contain a panoply of neurotransmitter-like molecules that can act on brain receptors. How am I doing for time? Who, who's keeping time? Seven minutes. Seven minutes. Oh, no problem. <laughs> Okay, so uh, essential amino acids, uh, which essential because we don't make them, but the, uh, there are other, these are the main ones, uh, uh, phenylalanine, tyrosine, and of course our favorite tryptophan. We don't make these, we have to get the precursors to them from our diet, i.e. from plants, and, uh, or animals that have eaten plants. So these amino acids, uh, are the main uh, neurotransmitters uh, that in amino acids that come from them are the main neurotransmitters that are involved in what we think of as conscious functions. You get from phenylalanine, you get uh, tyramine, dopamine, epinephrine, and so on, other neurotransmitter-like compounds. And from tryptophan, you get tryptamine and serotonin, melatonin, 6-methoxy, tetrahydro, beta-carboline, and many, many other cool molecules. In fact, tryptophan spawns really, once it's converted to tryptamine here by this decarboxylation process that they have been discussing, then tryptamine essentially spawns a whole family of more or less psychoactive compounds, you can think of it that way, through simple processes such as uh, methylation that gives you DMT, kind of the primal um, psychoactive tryptamine, but then some of the uh, relatives like bufotenine, if you hydroxylate it here, or psilocin, as if you hydroxylate it in that position. Um, so these are all pretty widespread enzymes in cellular metabolism that are able to, to do this. And it doesn't only happen in the brain, it happens in many, many, many organisms. In fact, it's not an exaggeration to say that nature is drenched in DMT. It is a very, very compound, common compound uh, in fungi. It, DMT or its relatives, right, is a very common compound in fungi, animals, amphibians, uh, and so on. Here's just an example of some higher plants that contain DMT. The numbers here of interest are th those in parentheses. These are the number of species. These are genera here. There are many, many species, and probably something like acacia, 1,200 species, probably 75% of that number contain some form of tryptamine. They're very, very common. And this is only part of the list. So DMT is everywhere. It's not an exaggeration to say that. What else do we know about DMT? It's the most mind-shattering psychedelic so far encountered by humans. Very simple metabolite of tryptophan. It's found in mammalian physiology. It's not orally active. So that's interesting because you can forage on DMT-containing plants all 
all day and nothing will happen unless you have to com happen to combine it with an MAO inhibitor. Suddenly the mystery is revealed, right? Or you consume something like psilocybin, which is already pre-programmed for human consumption, as my brother used to say, made for man, right? No technology and no effort is involved other than simply bending over and picking the mushroom and consuming it. But sooner or later, humans are clever. They discovered the, the tryptamines in these other plants and uh, how to activate them. So what I'm arguing here is that DMT and psilocybin are essentially catalysts for cognitive evolution. They don't come, they're not extraterrestrial. They come from Gaia. We're the aliens. So we're the least integrated into the natural world as a, of any species on Earth. We're separated. These messenger molecules are trying to send us the message, you guys have gone off track, you have to rethink it. So, you know, we have these set of receptors sensitive to DMT and these other tryptamines. They appear to open worlds to unknown and unseen universe, teeming with non-human life and intelligence. What's the message? Earth to monkeys, wake up. DMT is a messenger molecule, but it's a messenger, it's a message from an intelligent and compassionate biosphere, Gaia, if you will, to its most problematic species. Indigenous peoples think of these things as plant teachers. What do plant teachers teach us? First of all, symbiosis. They teach an appreciation of the interconnectedness and interdependent nature of all living things. And they teach us that we're part of this web of relationships, not separate from it. They teach us biophilia, love for life, an inherent human tendency to love living things, including each other, some of the time, hopefully more, more of the time. Animism, they give you an insight that really at some level everything is alive, everything is intelligent. Pantheism, the universe itself is divine. There is no separate divinity. The universe itself is waking up to itself. That's where the divinity lies. Informed by the psychedelic experience, these are not suppositions of the indigenous worldview. These are direct perceptions of the nature of reality. They are simply self-evident. And they're built into most indigenous worldviews and actually very close to the current sort of scientific understanding of the way that these systems work. What else do they teach us? That we learn new ways of thinking and perceiving. They stimulate wonder and awe. They stimulate ideation and curiosity. The experiences are usually beautiful. They stimulate our aesthetic sensibilities. They open the door to the universe within, a seemingly vast, dark continent populated with strange entities. They enable the experience of a transcendent aspect of reality, apparently not part of this continuum, possibly even beyond death. Does this have evolutionary consequences? We would hope so. Curious, imaginative, model-building primates are both the best and the worst thing that's ever happened to life on Earth. The stately pace of biological evolution no longer applies. The fate of life on Earth is in our hands. We can and do build technologies that can wipe out life on Earth. We can and will build technologies that will enable life to escape from Earth. We can and may build technologies that will enable life on Earth to flourish for billions of years. What we still lack and what psychedelics are still teaching us is the wisdom to make those choices. We are very, very clever in the technologies that we have created. We are not very wise and the question becomes, how can we find the wisdom to use those inventions? Well, what does our mother want? What does Gaia want? Gaia likes, life likes to grow. It proliferates, it likes to spread. So life nourishes and nurtures. Life likes to expand into every conceivable niche. Even though life originated on Earth, there is no reason for it to remain confined to Earth. Given life's fundamental impulse to colonize new territories, given the opportunity to expand beyond Earth, there's every reason to think that it would. We, curious, clever, imaginative, and psychedelically informed primates, as problematic as we are, are life's best chance to escape from this earthly cradle and spread throughout the galaxy. 
This is our destiny and it's life's destiny. In fulfilling it, we apply the lessons of 500,000 years of symbiosis with the plant teachers. Teachers that have been moving us in this direction all along. In fulfilling it, we will transform all of life on Earth and ourselves most of all. We may be human now, but once we leave the nest, we will be more than human. We will discover what we have always been. Infinite, unbounded, and immortal. Thank you.